talk about today, as Hernan said, is uh, proactive firefighter health. <clears throat> and I guess I would like to start with a question that if everyone could uh, please put in the chat their answer, just a simple yes or no answer, a very informal poll is, do you as a department currently practice on scene post-fire decontamination? So are you cleaning your gear on scene? Are you bagging it before you bring it back? Or are you not currently practicing that? <clears throat> Does uh, NFPA 1851, as you might know, uh, now has that as part of that standard. But I just wanna know if you're practicing that currently, we are gonna talk about it a little bit today and it might come up again as, as a subject for discussion. So, um, so <clears throat> uh, this is hazard control technologies. Um, uh, we are located in Fayetteville, Georgia, USA. I can get my slide to move here. We'll move along. There we go. <clears throat> it's our mission to encapsulate the world. Uh, we manufacture eco-friendly, innovative encapsulator technology under ISO 9001 standards. We have for, for many, many years. So our product has been the same for a long, long time. We have a worldwide distribution network, uh, including North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa. So our product is available and our products are available worldwide. And uh, one of the big reasons behind our, our products uh, reaching some current prominence is because of the, the forever chemicals and firefighting foam being hazardous to firefighters as well as to the environment. And then also because of the lithium ion battery uh, issue going on around the world as those take hold, need a way to extinguish those and F500 does that. <clears throat> so uh, what we're gonna talk about today though is a little bit different subject. We're gonna talk about firefighter health hazards and solutions. I myself, uh, have been in the fire service for over 40 years. Um, I was uh, uh, most recently the fire chief of a community of 25,000 people for four years. Prior to that, for 20 years, I was a uh, battalion chief for the Omaha, Nebraska Fire Department here in the USA, community of 400,000. And uh, prior to that, uh, and current, during that whole time, I lived in a small town of only 1,200 people, and was a volunteer firefighter for 38 years. I also taught for 19 years for the Nebraska State Fire Marshal Training Division as a part-time instructor. So I've had a kind of a wide and varied experience uh, in hazardous materials, firefighting, EMS, et cetera. Uh, but I've always been very, very interested in firefighter health and safety, and someone who likes to integrate technology in a way that makes firefighting more effective because uh, firefighters who are effective are more safe. And <clears throat> one of the things we're gonna talk about today is, is how to make you more effective uh, on the fire ground and uh, using some innovative products and techniques you can be more effective and therefore more safe. So the, the risk uh, is much greater today than it was in decades past. And, and some of you may have uh, a great grandmother or some one of that, someone of that age <clears throat> that you remember growing up in there and their home was furnished very simply. Uh, they didn't have a lot of extra things in their house like we do nowadays. Nowadays, we tend to take pride in how much we can purchase. And, and fill our homes with, plus the things are all synthetic. There's not as many natural products in our homes, not as many natural furnishings. So the fires burn hotter and faster and they put off more synthetic hydrocarbons as a result. And those synthetic hydrocarbons cause us health problems. So the modern day combustibles burn hotter with higher heat as long as the oxygen is available. Increased fire toxicity is a result of that. <clears throat> So our first video you're going to see is from UL Fire Safety Research Institute, and it shows that uh, on the left, you're going to see a fire with legacy furnishings, uh, older furnishings in the home, more simply furnished with natural products. And on the right, you're going to see a 
a room that's furnished with modern products that are more synthetic in, in nature. Uh, couches that are stuffed with polyurethane foam, covered with synthetic uh, coverings. Uh, uh, curtains are synthetic. Uh, some of the furniture, the actual coatings on the outside of the furniture uh, on the particle board plywood are synthetic. Uh, just pretty much everything in that room, except for probably the walls itself, has some synthetics on the right. These fires start off at the same time. The one on the left actually gets going a little bit quicker, uh, but it stays incipient or it stays small longer. The one on the right, you're going to notice that it puts off a lot more black smoke right off the, right off the bat from the very beginning. And <clears throat> because of that, um, uh, you'll notice that it starts to bank down very quickly. I'm going to pause it here for just a second. Um, we're at three minutes into the fire. The, the speed is set up on this. We're at three minutes into the fire, and the fire on the right, you'll see that smoke banking down. The fire on the left, you really see none of that yet. That fire is still incipient. It's not in the growth phase yet. Uh, the one on the right, though, as it's banking down, it's putting off all that, that very black smoke. And that black smoke is as a result of uh, unburned hydrocarbons, incomplete combustion that's collecting at the ceiling level, and what we call free radicals. As those synthetics burn, they put off a lot of free radicals with imbalanced electrons. They're seeking out other uh, uh, electron, other atoms with imbalanced electrons to to mate up with to create stability again. So as they come together. They create smoke and soot, and in that smoke and soot are compounds that are flammable and toxic to you and I, uh, toxic to victims if they were to breathe them. They're also toxic because they're absorbed through the skin. <clears throat> I'm going to get this going again here, and you're going to see that it progresses very rapidly and starts into what we call rollover. Uh, right now, the, the smoke is so black, it's obscuring the rollover, but there are flames up there as well and a lot of heat collecting at the ceiling. Okay, just over four minutes, we're going to see, pause it again. You can see that flame rolling over towards the camera. And if you had a thermal imaging camera, you probably would have seen that a lot sooner. If you had a, 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 a a hand line in your hand, a fire hose, you probably would have applied some water already and cooled it down, of course, it's good. Um, <clears throat> but as, as that, the byproducts of combustion that are collecting at the ceiling reach their point of flammability and their flammable concentration or their LEL, they begin to light up. And all of that heat as they light up is reflected back down to the floor and the contents of the room. And in a matter of seconds, everything in the room is going to be on fire. So rollover precedes flashover. It's a precursor. It's a sign that it's about to flash over. Well, it's just a matter of seconds once, once that smoke really takes off for that reflux to get back to the floor, that radiant heat ignites everything from ceiling to floor throughout. Notice the fire on the left, we're at four minutes and 51 seconds. It's still in the incipient phase. It's not banked down yet. So <clears throat> if 911 was called a couple of minutes after the fire got noticed, um, uh, we probably wouldn't even be at this fire yet on the right. Um, the fire on the left, we might still have time to get there to put that fire out without causing a lot of damage. Fire on the right, however, is threatening lives, causing damage. Uh, as firefighters make entry, they have a lot more toxic and heat exposure as, as you make entry. So all of those are factors that, that our time is being compressed as uh, a fire service. We have to get there faster. We have to get water on the fire faster and we have to operate more effectively and safely. So. Part of what we talked today about will be getting to the uh, getting fires cooled more effectively, efficiently, and protecting firefighters' health throughout the fire attack. The time to flash over on the right, 
only four minutes and 50 seconds. So it's, it's moved on from that room to other rooms already, starting to consume the entire structure. It's not just a room and contents fire anymore. Fire on the left is just starting to bank down at 25 minutes. It'll be over 30 minutes before it actually flashes over. So uh, <clears throat> the fire department actually used to have a little bit more time to get there before extreme damage occurred. So <clears throat> uh, with the modern furnishings uh, in all four experiments, they had basically less than five minutes to flash over. So we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the byproducts of combustion uh, that is almost always present in these fires and that's benzene. Whenever you have synthetics burning, you're gonna have benzene that comes off of the fire. <clears throat> so some experimentation was done in the, in the late uh, uh, teens, 2018, 2019, and the report came out in 2019 involving, uh, the report was done by NIOSH and uh, Illinois Fire Service Institute and they, they had some findings based on several test burns that they did with 31 firefighters involved. And what they found was that uh, firefighters uh, actually idled along their ambient uh, baseline readings for their benzene concentration from their exhaled breath, uh, idled at about uh, 20 to 30 parts per billion. And that's, uh, five to six times higher than a civilian smoker. Uh, all of the firefighters that were involved were non-smokers. So what you'll notice on the lower left part of the graph down here uh, is that that's the pre-fire uh, baseline reading for the firefighters for their exhaled breath. So the average is around 24 parts per billion, but some were a little higher, some were a little bit lower. So then they went in and did the burns. So the, the middle part of that graph was immediately following the burn, uh, what their readings were right after the, the exposure in the fire. And they all wore full turnout gear. They wore their SCBA, they wore protective hoods, they wore all their protective equipment. So this wasn't, this wasn't an inhalation exposure, it was an absorption exposure through their skin. So post fire, immediately they had uh, a median level of about uh, 40 parts per billion and, <clears throat> excuse me, 24 parts per billion plus. Uh, the, the middle line up there in it is over 40. And then some of them had up to around 60. And then one hour after they came back down to about where they had started on the, on the baseline reading. So you get, they get a spike of benzene immediately after that fire exposure and then fall back down after about an hour. Um, so you take that into account for every fire, uh, you get that benzene exposure, and benzene's just one of uh, many, many hydrocarbons and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that you can get exposed to in a fire that can cause cancer. Benzene's just one of those that we really, really know causes cancer. <clears throat> it's just an example. So uh, uh, that's something to be aware of that uh, it's not just an inhalation exposure, it's a skin absorption exposure. <clears throat> um, also, it should be uh, realized that when your skin is warm, your skin is 400 times more absorptive than it is when you're at room temperature. So something to be aware of. Uh, some other immediate risk from fires are high heat, uh, the, the toxic atmosphere, the immediately dangerous to life and health atmosphere, or IDLH. And lightweight construction is another threat because buildings don't last as long as they used to. They don't stand as long as they used to in a fire. Uh, and then fatigue and illness as well. So you get that, uh, that heat exposure. So high heat can cause a lot of uh, uh, heat exhaustion and things of that nature. Um, the longer you're in that high heat situation, the more the more potential there is for injury. And that injury can not only be for that duration of that incident, but it can lead to longer term problems as well and tissue damage and, and even brain damage. So uh, although it's, that's a, typically an acute incident, it can lead to longer term problems. 
Um, the IDLH are immediately dangerous to life and health. Atmosphere contains many of the compounds we, we talk about with uh, the benzene, but we also have things like carbon monoxide, which is not only toxic, but it's very flammable. And then we have hydrogen cyanide, which is suspected of causing uh, great confusion and combativeness in a firefighter in the example that they might lose their SCBA face piece or run out of air and, and take off their regulator. Uh, if you get exposed to hydrogen cyanide, it's suspected of causing combativeness and confusion. And uh, there have been situations where firefighters have lost their face piece, run out of air, uh, for some reason taking it off. And as they were being pursued for rescue by other firefighters, they got combative, they ran the wrong way, they did all kinds of uh, uncharacteristic things that they wouldn't normally have done. <clears throat> and that's they think is due to the hydrogen cyanide. It doesn't take very much for that for that to occur. But those uh, repeated exposures to uh, those gaseous compounds can not only have an acute effect, but also a long-term or chronic effect. Uh, fatigue and illness uh, from that, uh, uh, that, that, Heat exposure over a long period of time, it's more pronounced during the summer typically, but uh, when, you're, when you're in a fire that's, that's very hot for any duration of a period of time, you can, you can uh, suffer from fatigue and, and illness related to that heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Um, and <clears throat> uh, either one of those can lead to longer term problems. The heat stroke is more dangerous. Uh, your systems actually start to shut down in that case, but um, uh, it should be, and, and it's pretty widely known as one of the one of the things that causes firefighters health issues. So, <clears throat> some long-term risks of uh, firefighting exposure. Um, one of those is a heart attack, and for years we thought heart attacks and heart uh, issues like sudden cardiac death were, were the highest cause of death for firefighters. Uh, up to 51% of on-scene deaths were caused by, by, fire, by heart attack how, and cardiac events. However, recently uh, uh, it's been determined that 66% of firefighters' uh, deaths are as a result of cancer. And that's by a study by the in International Association of Firefighters. So uh, the cancer has kind of taken over that top spot as the, as the primary concern. And one of the things we're going to talk today about is how uh, taking some proactive measures can really reduce that exposure. <clears throat> so particulate matter from the smoke, we talked about the smoke and the soot in the air. Uh, once that gets deep into your lungs, it can cross over the alveoli where the blood and the oxygen meet and get into your bloodstream. And that can cause an inflammatory reaction in the lungs themselves and cause the lungs to malfunction, but also cause other uh, organ failure and system failure throughout the body and central nervous system effects as well. For example, from things like the, the hydrogen cyanide. So you can get a dual effect of uh, uh, simple and chemical asphyxiation as well as just central nervous system effects, uh, cardiac issues, you, you can pretty much name it, multi-system problems. <clears throat> Long-term uh, uh, non-acute exposure and re-exposure to these byproducts over and over and over again, not only through inhalation and standing around without your SCBA on, working without your SCBA on during overhaul or after the fire, approaching car fires without SCBA on, um, and then the repeated skin absorption issue, not only from uh, entering the fire, but handling turnout to your handling dirty fire hose after the fire, constantly being re-exposed and, and bringing those particulate matters back to the fire station in the fire truck in uh, and tracking them through the station, they get in the couches, they get into the bedding, they get into the firefighters' vehicles when they go home, or in the uniforms, they get tracked everywhere. If you're not progressively and proactively cleaning them 
uh, right from the start as soon as you uh, come out of the fire. Let's talk a little bit about cancer and focus on that a little bit. <clears throat> uh, again, uh, data reveals that 76% of career firefighter deaths are caused by cancer. Women who work as firefighters have an increased chance of getting breast cancer by six times. So that's a pretty remarkable uh, set of numbers. And, and that exposure is, is by three ways. Inhalation, again, not wearing your SCBA uh, probably for as long as you need to. Uh, absorption from contaminants going through and around under the gear, contacting the skin. Uh, and yes, we have uh, particulate hoods now that add some protection there because there's an extra layer in there that's impervious to those particulates, but uh, it still gets on you, it still gets in you, in your cuffs, around your neck, et cetera. We're doing a little bit better on that, but, but there's a lot of improvement still to be made. Ingestion, uh, so if, if you do stand around the fire scene and, and maybe if, uh, if you're a smoker, or you go to rehab and you handle that, that cup of uh, fluids to, to rehydrate yourself with dirty hands, or you go maybe even have a, a, a meal or something like that without adequate cleaning, you're gonna start ingesting some of that stuff as well. So here's some cancer types. You look at the, the graphic on the right, you're gonna see that in each one of these cases, Firefighters have a greater risk than the general public. Uh, brain cancer, for example, 1.3 times greater risk than the general public. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, one and a half times greater risk. Malignant melanoma, 1.3 times greater risk. Testicular cancer, very, you know, I know a lot of firefighters and I know a lot of firefighters that have been treated for testicular and prostate cancer. Testicular cancer, two times greater risk than the general public. Prostate cancer, 1.3. Multiple myeloma, 1.5. Leukemia, you know, you don't think of uh, people our age getting leukemia, but 1.14 times greater risk. Colon cancer, 1.2, although that might be because of fire station food. Uh, liver cancer, 1.2 uh, times greater risk. And skin cancer, almost 1.4 times greater risk. So yeah, I think we all know that we get we get exposed to some things uh, in our line of duty, whether you're a career volunteer firefighter um, that the general public doesn't get exposed to. But but there are definitely some some things that we can do better uh, uh, proactively to reduce that exposure so that we're not killing as many firefighters. We can. So in 2006, the Clemson University. Uh, did a study on wildlife impact of, of, of the product that hazard control technology manufactures, F500 encapsulator agent, to look at its impact on wildlife if it was used in a, in a wildlife uh, or wildfire type of uh, scenario. And it came up with some pretty remarkable results that impact firefighter health and safety, uh, as well as victim health and safety and survivability. <clears throat> so what they did was they did two side-by-side -side series of tests, one with plain water, uh, one with 3% F500 encapsulator agent and water together, uh, because F500 is uh, a water additive agent. Um, so the first series of tests was done with water. They had three, three each. Uh, they had a burning pan of polyurene. Polyurene is basically a rubber uh, compound, and uh, they inverted a glass funnel over the burning pan of toluene. And in the glass funnel, they had some little nozzles that sprayed water transverse across the pan. So the, the water was not striking the fuel itself. It was in the vapor space of the fire. Uh, so they could see what it did to the vapor itself and what effect it had. So what they were looking for was accumulation. And as the, the upside down funnel the transverse part of it, you can see that the soot collected on it there. <clears throat> well, how did they measure that? Well, they weighed the funnel, the clean glass funnel versus the dirty, the dirty funnel after the fire. And then they also measured the light, light transmittance across the flue that was created by the funnel. And then they used a high volume air sampler to sample the toxins out of the gas that came off of the burning toluene. And they sprayed water across there 
as they were burning the pan of toluene, they did the same experiment three times. Well, and they did it with F500. And again, they were measuring for the same things, foot accumulation, like transmittance or the ability to see, and then uh, the toxins that were actually present in the air. And again, they were not spraying it on the, the fuel itself, just in the vapor space above the fuel. So here's some results that were pretty remarkable from that, from that study. <clears throat> um, number one, the smoke was reduced by 68% by increase in visibility by the measurement of transmission of light. Soot accumulation was reduced by 97%. And then toxins were reduced by 98.6% when the F500 was used as compared to water. So yes, lab environment, that's pretty remarkable numbers there, but those numbers mean things. And if we talk about a study that recently came out a little bit later in the presentation, you're gonna see that these things do relate to real life field use. One of the things they determined <clears throat> uh, uh, that was interrupting the creation of the soot and smoke, why they had less soot and smoke uh, collect on the, on the glass funnel was they, they assumed what was happening is the interruption of the coalescence of free radicals. So they, uh, <clears throat> as they were looking at this, they're, they're looking at the high molecular weight of F500 encapsulator agent uh, in comparison to the molecular weight of the particles coming off of the fire as incomplete combustion. And they determined that as those particles are trying to come together and seek balance, uh, that the F500 was interrupting that process. So those soot and smoke particles couldn't be created. So we're interrupting the coalescence of free radicals. It's a very important concept as you, as you look at the application of F500, especially if you use it on initial fire attack. It's very important to use it on initial fire attack. <clears throat> We're gonna look at uh, contamination of firefighters and, and why it occurs. Um, <clears throat> so again, the number of percentage in elements in smoke from modern day fires is much higher than it's ever been. That, keep, that number keeps growing as we keep uh, gaining more and more synthetic products in our lives. And, and, uh, and really, if you look at the economic health of the world, as the economic health of the world uh, goes up, so does the number of uh, carcinogens uh, from fires because there's more synthetic products. In and all those toxins get absorbed into the body of firefighters. And when the, the higher temperatures occur inside of the fires and we have more protective gear on, our pores open up even more to let those, those products come in. <clears throat> so a really good uh, video. Uh, it was done by uh, University of Miami Palm Beach and Palm Beach County Fire and Rescue. Uh, it raises awareness as to how the byproducts of combustion travel from the fire scene back to the fire station. Uh, into the living quarters of the fire station, couches, chairs, kitchens, vehicles of firefighters, uniforms, bedding, everything. So this is a um, super invisible powder that's used actually um, for theft detection and cash, but um, one of the things we're trying to simulate is pretending that this is uh, black soot, just the type of same type of soot that comes off combustible and burning materials you would encounter in a fire uh, incident response. The initiative actually came to us right, uh, from the Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Department. They were very interested in understanding about how what they did for work was impacting their health, specifically how maybe being a firefighter or an EMS uh, responder may increase their risk for cancer. One of the things we were trying to do today is figure out is there a way we can demonstrate how maybe cancerous materials are transferred from a fire incident response uh, back to uh, the fire station and personal vehicle. And so today was really a teaching exercise and a scientific exercise of trying to see how we demonstrate where soot represented by this invisible dye might be transferring from when they go to respond to a fire and come back to the fire station. So the goal today was trying to be able um, to identify, can we feasibly show how so it's transferred? Uh,
from a fire incident response uh, back to their truck and back to the fire station. As you start going through the different scenarios of post-decon into the fire engine, back into uh, the bunk, into the restrooms, um, back here to the coffee table, it starts becoming less visible to the naked eye. But that powder um, that is invisible uh, over chronic exposure could be potentially causing um, cellular changes that we just uh, don't know about yet. And hopefully through some of our studies we can start identifying those changes. really an eye-opening experience for us because I anticipated you know some demonstration of how much um, dye would transfer I, I didn't realize the the breadth and scope of how much dye would spread um, within the different uh, scenarios that we were shooting in as well as uh, continue to transfer on after the first uh, fire engine truck so for me it was very impressive to see even um, some of the invisible dye transfer onto the bunks where they're sleeping at night um, even if it's a smaller quantity, you can imagine that low-dose chronic uh, exposure of this dye might be potentially increasing the risk uh, over time. We filmed today in the um, EMS's personal vehicle. You could easily see even fainter wisps of, of plume of, of dye on the ceiling as well as on the seat that were not direct contacts but were physically visible on that, suggesting that the particulate moves around. Um, so you might not visibly see soot, and in this case we got to see a dye, but that could potentially be increasing your cancer risk. The firefighter works as a, as a fulmite and is transferring you know, carcinogen from where their, their place of work back to their personal home. So we had an opportunity to have a child with us today to be able to demonstrate maybe what happens in passing uh, some of that soap using a soccer ball. Um, so we were able to um, have a child play with one of the EMS firefighters with that soccer ball and we were able to see a uh, second degree uh, transfer of uh, this invisible dye, i.e. the soot, transfer from the, from the EMS to the soccer ball and to the child. One of the activities that I hope uh, arises from this video that we're producing is that firefighters are a little bit more cognizant about how hy hygiene is a very important aspect um, and decontamination is an important aspect of post-incident fire response because it makes them a little bit more aware of not only of the, the soot that they bring back into the fire station but also what they might be taking to their personal homes and sharing with their families through secondary and tertiary contact of this soot um, on their on their own person and I hope that the firefighters see that as a more a way of crazy creating an opportunity for awareness and discussion of how we uh, improve um, you know hygiene and decontamination within the fire service This is um, super invisible powder that's used actually um, for theft. So as you can see by the, by the video that invisible uh, particles and products travel with you, cause secondary contamination after you leave the fire scene. They're on the bottom of your, your boots, they're on your gloves, they're on the turnout gear, they're on the SCBA. As you put all that stuff back into the, the passenger compartment, on the fire hose when you get done firefighting. So if we can eliminate that or most of that at the fire scene after the fire's out and not bring it back with us, it's gonna be much healthier for us. So an FPA 1851 came out with a change uh, about a year or so ago and it established uh, procedures for post-fire on-scene decontamination, which is, which is 
really, really important. So we're starting to treat fire scenes more like a hazmat incident and decontaminating firefighters right there. I used to do a lot of teaching of uh, weapons of mass destruction training, things like nerve agents and uh, blister agents and things like that. They get on your skin. Uh, those things are more acutely deadly. The cancer is more chronically deadly. <clears throat> so, but it's still particulate matter. And if we, if we employ activities to take it off of us sooner, we're going to have much less effect from it. So the <clears throat> protocol in NFPA 1851 calls for establishing a decontamination area, a warm zone, you might call it. Um, would you need to do that? You probably don't really need to do that. You could do it in the yard. You could do it in the street. But the, but the reason you need to establish a zone is so that people respect it and people actually go through it. If you don't establish a zone, then you probably won't step through the procedure either. And people will shortcut it. Uh, knowing a lot of firefighters, I know firefighters like to shortcut things and get back to the station, get back to their lives. But it's very, very important that we clean up. So four cones is all you need to establish an area, maybe a tarp. Uh, but you really don't even need the tarp. It's four cones, just so they know, hey, the cones are out. We're going to do this. Prepare the decontamination equipment, buckets and, and scrub brushes. Uh, and it doesn't really need to be very elaborate. Uh, and enter the decontamination area in pairs, and the firefighters can tend to decontaminate each other. They want you to keep your S on, they want you to keep your rest your uh, regulator on as well. Well, uh, obviously, you come out of a hot, smoky fire, the first thing that's coming off is your mask and your regulator because you're trying to get a breath of fresh air. If you're low on air, you're going to take that stuff off. So there needs to be a procedure for both with and without that on. They prefer you to leave it on if you can't. You might not have enough air left. You might be too hot. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you need procedures for with and without a face piece on. Uh, spray all the equipment with water, scrub with a scrub brush and soap to reduce the contamination by 85%. If you were around in the early 2000s where we did a lot of WMD training, uh, same figures, uh, uh, gross decon removes 85% of the contamination. Taking off your, your outer layer of clothes removes 85% of the contamination. Really no difference in the numbers here. Move all the equipment to the assigned area, place it in plastic bags. There's a procedure for cleaning it all in that area as well so that you don't get secondary contamination on you from handling the equipment. <clears throat> and you're, you're cleaning up the SCBA as well. Uh, using wipes to clean your face, hands, and your neck, and then you're moving things to the uh, end of the closed plastic bags and moving those back in with the fire truck. And you're getting on the truck with uh, maybe a pair of slide-on shoes on and getting back to the station. Next video shows the procedure behind that kind of step-by-step. Every firefighter knows a fellow firefighter that is either dealing with cancer or who has lost their battle of cancer. We see these most aggressive cancers in the fire service happening at a much younger age than the general population. The fires that burn today are much more volatile and hazardous than they were 20 years ago. Science has proven that materials that burn today contain carcinogens that are directly linked to firefighter cancer. Essentially, today's fires put us at greater risk than 20 years ago. We cannot stand idle while our brothers and sisters are dying. Since 2015, the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center has been studying this risk. We know that exposure to that is harmful to your health. And what they have discovered is that when we leave the fire scene, we bring the threat home with us. It's in your clothes, it's in the cab, it's in the firehouse, and for many of you, you bring it home to your family. Because of discoveries by the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, we are changing our approaches to decon processes. These are all steps that we must take to leave soot and dangerous compounds out the fire scene, lowering our exposure to known cancer hazards. To you, this may seem like simple cleaning practices, but when done regularly and consistently, our research has shown that your risk and exposures have decreased significantly. This firefighter did not engage in the decontamination practices and will be emitting carcinogens for the next four to eight hours. Everyone that they come into contact with, including themselves and the public, is at risk. This firefighter completed the on-scene decontamination procedures and has reduced their risk by 85%.
transition our fire service is going through today is similar to what we saw in the late 1980s with communicable disease. It was not uncommon for a firefighter or paramedic to regularly be exposed to blood or bodily fluids and operate in blood-stained clothing. You would never see those things done today. Today we are challenging the fire service culture again. The importance of this can't be underemphasized. It just may save your life. You should complete on-scene decon in the following steps. The incident commander will ensure that the decon area is established. The driver engineer will set up decon line with low pressure from a clean water source and mark the area with a cone. The driver engineer will connect the reducer to the discharge and hose to the reducer. Flake the hose out and attach the nozzle. Supply the line with idle pressure from a clean water source. After you leave the building, stay on air. When possible, decon should happen while you're still protected and before you go to rehab. On your way to decon cone, the straps of the SCBA should be loosened to aid the decon process. The crews will now decon each other. The firefighter with the least amount of air will be decon first. Make sure the PPE is tightened up and no areas of the gear when water can get inside the inner lining. Avoid getting water in the top of the jacket near the neck. Only spray the collar line down. The helmet will be cleaned independently later along with the other firefighter equipment. While being rinsed with water, you should stand straight upright with your arms out to the side. This will give a quick 360 rinse from the collar line down. Next, again, work with the collar line down. Use a soft bristle brush with soap mixture to scrub the gear. Be sure to get under the pack and straps and include all possible collection points such as armpit and groin area. Rinse soap mixture off the gear from collar line down. Next, clean the boots. Then switch positions. The firefighter that was decon will now do the same to the other firefighter, again while both staying on air. Once you both complete the outer scrub and rinse, you can come off air and start to remove your PPE. Fire gloves should be removed first while carefully avoiding skin contact with the exterior of the gloves. Bunker gear should be removed and placed in a drop zone. This area should be downwind of the rehab area. Using the department provided wipes, clean your hands very well. Use a new set of wipes for your neck, front and back and the area behind your ears. Use different wipes when cleaning your entire face. Don't forget your head and hair. Lastly, use a fresh wipe for your eyes. When you're released from the scene, you will bag your gear with department-issued bags to decrease your exposure to off-gassing. Although it has undergone gross decon, it is recommended that you still wear EMS gloves. You will bag the following pieces of equipment. Gloves, coats, boots, and pants, and helmet. In this order, you will bag your gear. After folding the coat, it will be placed on top of the gloves followed by the boots and pants. Lastly, clean the helmet by scrubbing the outer shell and wiping the inner soft lining. Do not saturate the inner lining. After cleaning, place the helmet in the bag with the top pointed toward the boot and coat. The bag will be twisted and taped closed. The remaining loose end will be folded over and taped again to complete the sealing. If a second set is not available at the scene, the firefighter hood and gloves should be exchanged for clean ones at the scene. All tools and equipment that were used at the incident will be cleaned on the scene with a soft bristle brush and soap water mixture. The bags of gear will be placed in the apparatus. Bagged PPE can be easily deployed if the need arises. Firefighters should shower within the hour when returning to the fire station. I know for many of us this is more than a job. This is your family. This is your community. The changes you make today will impact you, your family, and your colleagues. Not just for today, but for years to come. Together, we can change the culture and we reduce our risk for cancer. <clears throat> so, uh, all of those are, are great steps and, and steps in the right direction, but they are somewhat reactive. So. 
uh, what we're going to talk about next is proactive prevention. Dan? Yes. I'm sorry, but I have to leave here for another webinar with the National Weather Service. My name is Tom Moore. I'm from Indiana, EMA director. I'm also a firefighter. Um, I just wanted to ask you real quick, would F-500 be added to, I'm in the process of doing grants on getting all our department's decon packs from TFT decon okay. packs. Um, can F-500 be added to those decon packs? Absolutely. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about here shortly is, is that they can be added to those decon packs. I can you know, your email address in the chat, I can send you a little uh, flyer on, on exactly how that's done. One of those decon packs will decon about 40 firefighters. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to get going for this. So we're got winter, good. winter weather coming into next uh, yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, we're good so, too. So. So. All right, appreciate your attendance. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to talk about proactive prevention now how to eliminate those hazards in front of the nozzle. From the very beginning of the incident, we're gonna shorten your duration on scene. We're gonna shorten the amount of exposure you get. Uh, we're gonna impact the, the quantity of the exposure that you get. Uh, we're gonna make things better for the victims at the same time. Uh, really, really uh, reduce your time on scene as well. So it's a very cost-effective way to go about this. <clears throat> um, so, uh, it includes particulate hoods, encapsulating the toxins with, toxins with an encapsulator agent like F500, uh, encapsulation of fuels, rapidly reducing the heat, reducing the soot and smoke, elimination of steam, which that steam carries that contamination uh, inside the, the cuffs and things like that on your turnout gear, things that aren't perfectly closed up uh, and into the materials. Uh, we're going to reduce the fatigue and illness, the heat heat exhaustion. Um, <clears throat> so that includes uh, a little bit of an understanding of encapsulator technology and how encapsulator works uh, so that you can understand how it impacts what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish. So encapsulator agent, the type of water additive that we talked about before, so it mixes with water. Um, the basic building blocks of an encapsulator agent are what we call spherical micelles. They're very, very tiny uh, at a molecular level. Um, uh, there's millions and millions of them in a single tiny droplet of water. <clears throat> the spherical micelles are capable of, and not only capable of, they, they're very attracted to absorbing or encapsulating carbon molecules, as well as polar and nonpolar hydrocarbon vapor and liquid molecules. Very, very important concept there as far as uh, the decontamination process goes, but as well the firefighting process as well. Um, the encapsulator agent separates the fuel from the oxygen on a chemical molecular level. And the nice thing about that encapsulation is it keeps those uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like benzene that cause cancer from harming you because they perform, they form a, a cocoon around that molecule. So this little video shows you how an encapsulator agent uh, is formed. Encapsulator technology, the next generation of fire and hazard mitigation. First, we start with a simplified version of a single encapsulator agent molecule consisting of a hydrophilic polar head which loves water, dissolves in water, and a hydrophobic nonpolar tail which fears water and will do anything to get away from water. Once the EA molecules enter the water, they instantaneously and automatically orient with the nonpolar tails inward and the polar heads outward, forming millions of spherical micelles. Micelles travel towards and exit the nozzles, forming EA droplets. My cells nearest to the surface of each droplet automatically break apart. The nonpolar tails orient outside the droplet with polar heads on the surface, forming an EA skin on the surface of every droplet. In addition to the EA skin, there are millions of molecular spherical micelles within each droplet. Okay, so if you look at that, that single droplet of water, 
which is made smaller because the F500 has a surfactant in it, so it allows the droplets to become smaller uh, naturally. Uh, the outside of the water droplet is coated with a, a, a dissolved surface that's filled with F500 molecule hydrophilic heads, and then the hydrophobic tails are pointing outwards. Uh, inside of the water droplet are millions and millions of spherical micelles, those little golf balls you see there, with, uh, with the molecule oriented in the other direction. So the, the hydrophilic heads are pointed out towards the water, and the hydrophobic tails are pointed in away from the water. Inside of each one of those spherical micelles is where those hydrocarbons and carbons get trapped and hidden away from oxygen of combustion, but also uh, guarded away from harming you. Encapsulate. So <clears throat> an encapsulator agent, uh, agent, as far as fire is concerned, it uh, interrupts uh, oxygen interaction and interacts with all four legs of the fire tetrahedron simultaneously to interrupt that combustion process. <clears throat> It's applicable to all fire classes, uh, A, B, uh, metals, uh, even the greases and things like that, the kitchen fires, and there's no, no contraindications uh, for using it on electrical fires that wouldn't be applicable to water. So your standoff distances with a broken stream are applicable. Obviously, we don't recommend that you, uh, you use it if, uh, until the circuit is dead and and uh, verified dead by a power company or something like that, but uh, it's no more conductive than water. <clears throat> uh, encapsulator technology has a lot of decontamination advantages. If you take a simple pump-up sprayer or like Mr. Moore was talking, uh, maybe a, a TFT decon pack or one of HCP's uh, packs, you can uh, simply spray the firefighter's turnout gear from head to toe on the scene before you take it off and you're encapsulating those carbons and hydrocarbons in situ on the turnout gear, flush them off with a little bit of water, it washes all that debris off, but, but those carbons and the hydrocarbons that would otherwise potentially be absorbed through your skin uh, by a handling of that turnout gear are encapsulated from that moment forward and, and rendered non-harmful. Um, so it really, really knocks down that potential contamination from right there. So if you think about your turnout gear, even if you are bagging it, what happens to it from there? How many of you use an independent service provider? Or how many of you bring it back to the station and launder it yourself? So somebody's got to open up that bag. What happens when they open up that bag? They get a, they get a nose full of good stuff, right? <clears throat> so that, that stuff causes cancer too. It's the same stuff that was at the fire scene. So if we encapsulate it with F500 on the fire scene, and that just involves wetting it down a little bit, and then you can rinse it off if you want, but you don't have to. Um, and then you bag it up and bring it back for, for further laundering and cleaning. Uh, you're encapsulating it uh, and leaving that contamination there. And then when somebody else handles it downstream, they're not getting exposed to quite as much uh, stuff. Um, probably a, a lot, lot less. Uh, the only thing that would be off-gassing is pots that you didn't hit with the encapsulator. Um, uh, F500 is a fluorine-free, non-toxic, non-corrosive agent. It offers safety to firefighter and the equipment. Um, <clears throat> there's no, no harm to skin or anything like that if it gets on your skin. The one uh, thing you have to be careful of is just not to get it in your eyes because there's a little bit of an eye irritant because of the surfactant. So you have to be a little bit careful of that. The face piece is off, uh, throw on some safety glasses, close your mouth, try not to spray people in the face. Um, helmets and things like that should come off. As the video showed, they didn't really want you to, to saturate the liner, but in, in uh, the case of uh, an encapsulator agent, if you uh, filled a bucket with water and added the correct percentage of an encapsulator agent in there, you could actually dip all the gloves, flashlights, helmets, things like that in there. And, and eliminate that contamination, lock it up, encapsulate it right at the scene. <clears throat> F500 has a pH of seven, which is absolutely neutral. 
complies with an FDA 1851 for use in turnout gear laundering. <clears throat> All it takes is three to four ounces of F500 encapsulator agent in your extractor, and it, it, that's plenty to, to do the job. Um, uh, if you see the pictures of the turnout gear up there on the right, uh, the turnout gear that's dirty was laundered three times with the fire department's normal turnout gear cleaning compound in their extractor, and that's all the cleaner they could get it. With three ounces of F500 in the same machine, that's the same pants on the right afterwards. You come out much, much cleaner. It, and the nice thing is that you're not just moving uh, harmful hydrocarbons around, you're encapsulating them, you're, you're destroying them. <clears throat> um, so it, it just, it works a lot better. So take that pair of pants, uh, somebody's got to handle it, right? Somebody's got to take it apart, take the suspenders off, take the liner out, take everything out of the pockets. Um, same thing with the coat, uh, same thing with, with the helmet, anything in your pockets has got to come out. Don't really think about the turnout gear. How about all that fire hose that you brought back to the station that you're trying to clean up? How about the DSCBA? The more of that you can do on the scene and eliminate bringing that stuff back together. So this is uh, 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 turnout gear decontamination process with F500 in a, in a pack. you're seeing here is them just with some gloves and personal effects in a bag. We're adding F500 into that bag with our what we call a TKO nozzle and encapsulating those hydrocarbons in the bag. Pretty simple process. That five gallon bucket. Um, uh, just all you need to do is wet it thoroughly with the, with the encapsulator agent and then you can rinse a lot of that particulate matter off right there on the scene. Uh, you'll see those guys are wearing tennis shoes and no gloves. I don't recommend that. <laughs> I recommend have a, keep a couple of, of uh, pairs of uh, knee, knee boots in the side of the truck just for decon, a couple pairs of the gauntlet style gloves from the farm store, and uh, they're like two bucks a piece, and they'll do a lot of good for you. It can be re rinsed off and reused. Well, this video. Uh... Hi, Cindy L from the Firefighter Cancer Foundation, and this is an amazing opportunity to not only learn through burning and real life fire training, but also learning ways to reduce exposures to cancer and, and what causes cancer. 
it's interesting because we are learning and viewing a variety of products around the world. We just witnessed uh, the product F500. Uh, interesting thing that occurred is something that we don't think about. If the product is applied ahead of time to the cock loft and the ceiling space of the building, when that fire starts, the seat of the fire burns up, that heat causes the air and the moisture to condense, the F500 activated, it encapsulated, and it actually put the fire out. The firefighters were pretty disappointed because they didn't get to fight the fire as long as they were hoping to. The good news is they weren't exposed to the cancer-causing products that we want to change. We walked in afterwards and it was a different taste, a different smell, and a different feel to the air in the building. And the air was actually totally clear uh, following. So as we continue to look at these products moving forward in the future, we're excited to learn more about ways that we can reduce exposures for our firefighters around the world and be smarter about how we're fighting fire and not getting sick. <clears throat> so an encapsulator agent is definitely uh, uh, different than a foam, not a foam. It's a water additive agent. It readily mixes with water. Uh, we're not trying to create bubbles. We're trying to actually mix it with the fuel and or get it to absorb into uh, textiles, materials, things like that, so it can do its job. And thinking about it from a firefighter aspect and a firefighting aspect is uh, like two different worlds as compared to thinking out about it from a decontamination aspect. As long as you wet the material with it adequately, you're going to encapsulate those compounds and keep them from harming people throughout the laundering process. So, so think about the people downstream from that, that uh, fire scene as well. <clears throat> so. We're going to talk about the, the three big superpowers of an encapsulator agent. The first one is encapsulation. Hazard Control Technologies presents F500 encapsulator technology. So as you can see, when he sprayed that on there, he was not trying to create a blanket. He didn't use a roll-on method. He didn't use a rain-down method. He didn't bank it off of nothing, trying to get it to readily mix with the fuel. That's a, just a class B fuel on the ground. So the, the gentleman on the uh, your left, he lights what's not treated and starts it to burn. And what you're gonna see here in a second is him put out the rest of the fire with the encapsulator agent as well as them try to disturb the blanket. Well, it's not a blanket, it's mixed with the fuel. So you can't disturb it and create a fire again. This demonstration shows a large gasoline spill. Half is treated with 3% F500 solution. Flame is applied, but only ignites the non-treated area. Then the fire is extinguished using a dispersed spray pattern sweeping over the surface. The F500 encapsulates the gasoline vapor molecules, rendering them instantly non-flammable and non-ignitable. You will notice at one point the firefighter with the torch will disperse the F500 solution on the ground without any reignition. If this were foam, the gasoline would have reignited where he kicked the foam aside because foam only lays on the surface and does not encapsulate. So as you, you saw there, um, uh, the the compounds that make up gasoline, the volatile organic compounds that make up gasoline, the fact that they're volatile is what causes that fuel to burn. Uh, the encapsulator agent immediately interrupts that process, encapsulates those hydrocarbons. Well, it does the same thing to the VOCs and PAHs that cause you cancer. So it's gonna encapsulate them, render them non-volatile, render them non-harmful to you. Hazard control technology. Second superpower is rapid heat reduction. So the encapsulator agent droplets create a thermal circuit. The outer skin with those uh, polar, excuse me, nonpolar tails and polar heads uh, absorbs heat very, very readily and uniformly throughout a bunch of tiny water droplets as compared to water alone because they have lowered surface tension. And uh, 
then the spherical micelles inside of the water droplet that are packed tight in there absorb the heat as well. So we get extremely uniform and rapid heat absorption into that, uh, into that water droplet. <clears throat> and because of that, we don't have the, the random pockets of absorption that create steam like plain water does. You don't have a scalding effect. You have a very uniform, warm, comfortable vapor that comes off of it rather than uh, steam here and there and water running off. And because of that, we have very, very rapid heat absorption. So we have rapid cooling. Uh, and in this video, you're going to see an interior fire attack where uh, cooling occurred and uh, rapidly reduced the temperature down to under uh, under. So uh, in that car fire, you saw rapid, rapid heat reduction. Uh, even with the modern metals in car fires that can react to plain water, it won't react with F500. You won't get that nasty reaction. It wasn't the video I thought it was going to come up, but there's another video in, in two slides from now where they do an interior fire attack that has some remarkable results as well with temperature. Uh, free radical interruption is the third superpower of uh, an encapsulator agent. Uh, again, those <clears throat> encapsulator agent molecules have a high molecular weight. They absorb the free radical energy, interrupting the coalescence, the chemical reaction between the different free radicals when they're trying to create new compounds. Um, and that really eliminates that, that heat and smoke very, very quickly. Uh, this image up here on the right, the circle, <clears throat> that's an actually a, a representation of a spherical micelle with with the uh, hydrocarbons trapped inside of it. <clears throat> um, this was a, a, a burn operation conducted between hazard control technologies, uh, 10-8, a fire distributor of ours, and the Cornelia Fire Department. So this is a class A burn simulator in a container like many of you probably have. They're burning pallets with class A materials, but you know how hot and smoky it gets. Well, if you'll notice, he just did a combination attack. The big circles, you know, probably not your preferred attack for an interior fire, but they're, they're extremely effective. What usually happens with, a, with a, uh, a combination attack, especially when you overapply it, is thermal inversion. You get all that steam and frag products come all the way to the floor and create firefighter soup. Well, because there's that 500 in the line, you're not going to see any of that here. Pattern, we can move. 
Sorry about that. Go back to that point of the video. So immediately uh, after the attack, this one to two minutes later, they stepped back in there. And this was the visibility. There really wasn't any smoke left. It was all cooled down. And one of the really remarkable things is, you know how much carbon monoxide would normally be in an atmosphere like this, probably six to 1200 parts per million. Uh, watch, watch the results. Well, if I could stay on the right, right button, you can watch the results. <laughs> with CO reading of 13 parts per million, just a minute or two after the, the initial attack. CO 13. CO in the burn room, 13 parts per million. So think about your victim's survivability, uh, uh, activities during overhaul, uh, that those carbons, hydrocarbons, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are being reduced very, very rapidly because of the initial attack with F-500. So in this video, we've got a pile of tires burning. You know, everybody knows how black the smoke and soot is that comes off the tires because there are six to eight quarts of oil in each one. Um, so this firefighter does a, a very good job, tests the stream on the ground, make sure he's got F500 in the stream. And then what I really, really want you to pay attention to, yes, the tires go out really, really quickly. Watch the smoke disappear above the tires as soon as he hits it. The smoke is gone. As soon as he hit it, that smoke is gone. And that's because of the interruption of the coalescence of free radicals. How would that impact your safety and health if you were inside a fire? There's no, no forever chemicals in it or anything like that that's harmful. And that, that's not steam. That's just a warm vapor coming off of there. It's not uncomfortable. And you could walk over and pick up those tires with your bare hands. It was a rapid cooling. So <clears throat> one thing that very recently came out just in, in this past August was a, a study of some scientific fire setting that were completed by the Laval Canada Fire Department. Laval is an area just north of Montreal, about 400,000 people uh, population in that, in that region. And they've got uh, one fire department that served the region and, and more or less formed a city, uh, even though it was a series of suburbs of Montreal. It's now one fire department. So they did uh, a series of interior fire attacks uh, four, four attacks. Uh, each time uh, a new group of firefighters went in with clean protective hoods, clean helmet liners and suspension, and then uh, they did their interior fire attack like they normally would, and they came out, the hoods were taken off and bagged and sent to a lab at Ottawa University for testing, and they tested them for these 19 uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon compounds. And uh, these are the results from those interior attacks. So 
what you see on the screen in column two is with that, uh, the initial burn without encapsulator agent, the second one, same burn, same room with encapsulator agent. Uh, and what you can see there in, in, in those cases where there was a measurable amount, the DL indicates uh, that it was uh, below detection limits. So those weren't really actually measured. Um, but in all the other cases, um, burn one, you can see a, a pretty drastic reduction in some real life uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon compound uh, amounts in the atmosphere that those firefighters were exposed to that ended up collecting on the outside of their, their protective hoods. So in a lot of these cases, you can see 71% reduction, 83% reduction, 60%, and so forth. Uh, a very significant reduction in firefighter exposure. Um, and then on, they did another two burns in the same room, one without and one with encapsulator agent. Again, uh, a significant reduction in several of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and uh, some of them were reduced so much that they went from uh, a measurable amount to below a measurable amount. So we really couldn't get a percentage on them, uh, but they were reductions nonetheless. And some of those were benzene compounds. So it really does make a difference uh, at an improved result in the concentration of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons 18 times out of 20. Uh, one of those, it came out equal right here. And one had a de deterioration one time out of 20 right here. Um, but that same compound didn't show up on the previous. So, um, <clears throat> but overall a pretty remarkable result. Um, a lot of other things came out of this study. Um, uh, they noticed a remarkable, uh, more rapid cooling, uh, more rapid return of visibility in all cases. And they did a couple of exterior fire attacks on the same structure, uh, more or less simulating a, uh, a transitional attack from the outside. And one thing we noticed by watching that, that video of that was they had to put a very small amount in the, in the exterior window and, and then they stopped, but the fire conditions inside kept getting less and less and less even without continued attack. So it led them to the conclusion that there was a lot less water needed for fire attack. Um, you did it on a transitional fire attack, uh, it would buy you a lot of time to wait for more crews to, to show up. So you have your two in, two out, your rapid intervention crews, et cetera. Uh, gives them time to, to, to arrive on scene, to assemble crews. Um, uh, that transitional attack with the 500 would really help the survivability of victims and pets that might be on the inside. And then overall, your time spent on scene is much less, your contamination is less. So all of those things lead to a proactive improvement in firefighter safety and health, mostly because of improved effectiveness. Um, if you would like a copy of that study, um, we can send it to you in PDF form. It's really eye-opening. Uh, they have a lot of very good uh, uh, narratives in there as well as what the firefighters experienced when they were going through this. And it was all done with the, with the effort to reduce cancer exposure because they had some members that died of cancer. So um, if you would like a copy of that, put your email in the, in the chat and we'll make sure and get, get your copy. Um, uh, the four super power of uh, F500 encapsulator agent is that it's fluorine free, biodegradable, non-corrosive, doesn't contain any of the PFOA or PFAS uh, compounds that, that foam does. And uh, it, it, it does the same thing to fire runoff that it does to the turnout gear, it does the same thing to smoke emitting from fires that it does. Uh, to your exposure, it reduces it all. So it's a very environmentally beneficial chemical if you use it on initial fire attack. <clears throat> uh, just some different articles from uh, uh, recent past on firefighters uh, battling um, occupational cancer, uh, issues with foam and PFAS and, and chemicals that cause cancer in the foam. Uh, pretty easy to find. 
sure you're, most of you are aware of those. So another thing, <clears throat> not only is, is F500 cost effective from the fact that you're on scene less, you look at a, you look at a fire department of any size and they're worried about uh, resources being stretched too thin, additional calls, overlapping calls, things like that. This with using a chemical like this, you're on scene for a, a shorter duration. You can get back in service faster, recover from the fire, uh, and make ready for the next. <clears throat> so from that aspect, it's very cost effective by itself. But we've known for a long time insurance companies will typically pay for consumables like foam and things like that that are used. You can use uh, a cost recovery mechanism to recover your cost of concentrate used for F500 as well. We partnered with a company called EF Recovery uh, to uh, assist you with, with going for use of the product on every fire. And uh, you can determine with their assistance what you are and aren't going to bill for. Um, they use a simple phone app for you to be able to enter some information about the fire to submit for billing where you can do it back on a computer back at the station. A little quick video here explaining the EF recovery process. There's been a crash. People are hurt. Fluids are leaking. Traffic needs directing. As you arrive on the scene, your priority is safety, care, and containment. The last thing on your mind is the cost of the call. But here's a question. Should your department have to pay for someone else's recklessness? If a city ordinance or county resolution says you're entitled to reimbursement, your department has a right to its money. And that's the problem. Do you have the time and the resources to chase it? We do. We're EF Recovery, one of the most experienced providers of billing services. Welcome to Response Recovery, a claims management program that recovers incident response dollars and gives them back to your department. With the Response Recovery Program, we have the infrastructure, insurance company relationships, and knowledge of the law to get you the money you deserve. Here's how it works. Using your fire reporting system, we locate and extract the MVA, obtain the incident report, and fill out all the incident paperwork. You approve the claim, we file it, and we pursue collection. If the claim is wrongfully denied, our team of experts pursues the insurance company and makes sure the claim gets paid. Submitting information to us is easy and the claims review process is fast and convenient. There are no minimums or special requirements and training is a snap thanks to our templates for manpower, consumables, and equipment that save you time. Best of all, you're in full control of the program. You determine who we speak to, the insurance company, the responsible party who caused the incident, or both. Our customer service is second to none. We use the maximum care, consideration, and professionalism whether we're working with you, with insurance companies, or with residents in your community. We have safeguards to ensure accuracy and compliance, and we bill for all types of runs, so whatever incident your department responded to, we'll get to work on the reimbursement for it. If you're ready to recover the reimbursable expenses that you've earned, and you want to work with an experienced, seasoned partner, you want this flexible program. The Response Recovery Program from EF Recovery. Because your department deserves every dollar it's earned. There's been a crack. <clears throat> so, uh, in conclusion, and we're going to have a question and answer period after this, so don't go away. If you have questions, make sure you type those into chat so we can make sure we address them. Uh, but we will have question and answer afterwards. I, I will say this. Uh, um, as a fire chief for a long time, somebody that I've trained with firefighters, is somebody has to step up to the plate to make a difference and, and change behavior. And it usually comes down to, to one person having to step up and make that difference and to make sure it happens for a period of time and that firefighters buy into it. And um, uh, one thought that uh, comes to mind is that, you know, things don't get better on their own. Uh, we have to make them better. So uh, somebody's got to step up, 
hopefully you're you're that person that can make a difference for your for your department, your community, make someone's life uh, longer by taking some proactive steps to to make a difference. Oh, <clears throat>